This will be another episode of Fighting the Famine. A study to put out there to get people interested in the Bible, to give you something to feast on for the week. And if you get the notes down for this and study it out yourself, then it's a whole topic, a, a whole character study that you have down in your Bible. And the topic we're looking at for this series right now is Bible Villains. And today it's going to be actually three in one. Three that, that go together, actually. And it's Balak, Balaam, and Baal. And you know how we've got the Godhead. You know, every good Bible teacher believes in the Godhead. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Well, we know that the devil has a counterfeit for everything God does. So what you have with these guys is a picture of the satanic trinity, Baal, Balak, and Balaam picture the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And if you really want to get into this study, I would suggest reading Numbers chapter 22 through 25, at least, and then begin the study. Or listen to the study and then read Numbers 22 through 25. But let's look at our three applications for this. Historically, Balak, the king of Moab, Balak's the king of Moab, and he's intimidated by Israel, just like Pharaoh was, as we saw uh, a few weeks ago. And um, Israel are mighty and many. There's a lot of them. They've just uh, killed some armies that had already whooped up on Balak. So he's like, if they whooped up on the armies that whooped me, what are they going to do to me? And he's intimidated. So he wants Balaam, who's a sorcerer, not just a prophet, but a sorcerer. He wants him to curse Israel. And God won't let Balaam do it. And Balaam gives counsel to Balak to cause Israel to intermarry with the Moabites, which Balak is the king of Moab. And by Israel intermarrying and things with the Moabites, they end up getting into fornication and idolatry, which will cause God to destroy them himself. And the inspirational application is Balaam, like many people, like many pastors and preachers out there today, they love the riches of this world more than they do obeying the word of God. When you read this, it should remind you that obeying the Word of God is the first thing you need to do. And just don't worry about the riches of this world and the things that the world can offer you or how the world can promote you and give you honor. And another thing about Balaam is in this story, he looks spiritual for the most part all the way through it. But if you really notice, he has... It's it's all fake. It's a he has a fake spirituality and a wicked motive the entire time. Because he's saying the right things with his mouth, but at the same time, by his actions you can see that he really wants the promotion and the honor and the money from Balak. And he looks spiritual on the outside, but he has a wicked motive the entire time. And we also learn that the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, not the root of all kinds of evil, but the root of all evil. Now, doctrinally, Balak is a picture of the Antichrist, Balaam is a picture of the false prophet, and Baal is a picture of the devil, the dragon. And like I said, this is a picture of the satanic trinity because the devil loves to counterfeit the Lord. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the devil has a trinity, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And that's in Revelation 16, 13, where it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, here are some celebrities between Balaam and the false prophet. Well, in Revelation 13, another thing you want to do is read Revelation 13. But number one, the false prophet has 
two horns like a lamb. So he's going to act like a peace lover. Two horns like a lamb, you know, gentle. He's going to act like he's a peace-loving, gentle-speaking, great guy. He's going to act like he's all about peace, peace, even though there is no peace. Revelation 13, 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. You see, he will speak smooth words like that, and... He's going to speak as a dragon, though, at the same time. You won't be able to believe what he says. You see, Revelation 13, 11 also says, and he spake as a dragon. It's like the what, what he says and the way he says it don't match up if you know your Bible. If you've got spiritual discernment. And you'll notice in Numbers 22 through 24 that Balaam speaks very spiritual. As a picture of the false prophet, he speaks very, very spiritual and religious, but his intentions are evil. And if you were a Bible believer, you would spot it right away. You can't believe anything that he says. Number two, the false prophet has supernatural powers to do miracles. He can call down fire from heaven. Revelation thirteen twelve says, He exerciseth all the power of the first beast. Well, the first beast gets his power from the dragon, which is the devil. So this means he also gets his power from the same source. And Balaam, as a soothsayer, would also get his power from the same place, from the devil. Because obviously he's not getting it from God. God doesn't care for soothsayers, obviously. In Joshua thirteen twenty two, it says, Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer. And the children of Israel slay, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. So God obviously condemns soothsayers. Look at what Micah 5.12 says. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. There's going to be a time when there's no more soothsayer. Soothsayers. God's going to get rid of all of them. And a soothsayer is someone that can foretell the future. And Balaam was obviously very known for this, had a very good a very good reputation among people because Balak, the king of Moab, was seeking him out specifically for him to curse Israel. But if you look up soothsayer, it means a foreteller, a prognosticator, one who undertakes to foretell future events without inspiration. That's the definition for it and Obviously, God's not for that because only God can tell the future. And unless God told you the future, then you don't know it. The only way God's telling me and you the future today is through the Holy Bible, the King James Version in English. Uh, and if you get it any other way, you know, then you're a false prophet because he's not telling you future events outside of the Bible. The next thing, the false prophet and Balaam are both slain by the sword. In Joshua 13, 22, it said, Did the children of Israel slay with the sword, referring to Balaam? In the false prophet's case, it's the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God, that puts an end to the false prophet. Look at Revelation 19, 20 through 21. It says, And, I, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that set upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So the Lord's just coming down on a white horse. He's going to put an end to the Antichrist and the false prophet and their army. And he's going to use that sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth to do it. It's the word of God. So Balaam is slain with the sword. The Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Most likely the Lord just speaks the word, the sword, and puts them in there. But with those, with that being said, those were some ways that the ba uh, Balaam and the false prophet are alike. Now, I want to point something else out to you. You see, I think Balaam, this story of Balaam, Balak, and Baal is one of those stories that's kind of known, but people don't talk about it very much. 
I've not heard preaching about it much. I've not heard much teaching about it. Maybe because it's in the end of the book of Numbers. Nobody reads Numbers. <coughs> but um, Balaam is also mentioned in the New Testament uh, several times. And it, it talks about the way of Balaam, the error of Balaam, and the doctrine of Balaam. And I want to show you what all three of those things are. In Numbers twenty two thirty two, 32, the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord himself, tells Balaam that thy way is perverse before me. How would you like for God to come down and tell you that your way is perverse before him? That would make you want to change your ways. But that's the way of Balaam. And in 2 Peter 2, 15, Peter's talking about these wicked men which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's the way of Balaam, loving the wages of unrighteousness. You see, like I said, he pictures a false teacher or preacher who's in it for the money, who doesn't realize, as 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. He doesn't realize, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, 5, the verse before that, that where it says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdrawal thyself. A lot of these guys think the more money they get, the more wealth they get, the bigger house they get, that that's godliness. The more gain they get, that that means they're godly. They're wrong. 1 Timothy 6, 2 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Balaam loved money, even though he pretended not to on the outside. 1 Kings 21, 20 describes how Ahab, King Ahab, sold himself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. That's exactly what Balaam is, a sellout. That's exactly what the people in Hollywood are, complete sellouts. That's exactly what a lot of preachers are today, complete sellouts. And in Matthew 4, 9, the devil tells the Lord all these things, well, I give thee if that will fall down and worship me. You see, the devil can give you a lot of things if you'll do what he says. If you'll damn souls to hell with him, if you'll fall down and worship him, he can give you a lot of things. You see, the flesh, the world, and the devil can promise you all these temporal things. And loving these things leads you down the perverse way of Balaam. Now, that's the way of Balaam. What's the error of Balaam? Well, in Jude one eleven it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gang sing of Cor. Cory. <coughs> and Cory is Korah, in the, uh, who's, which is also in the book of Numbers. Now, the heir of Balaam was Balaam going against God's chosen people, Israel. And once again, what was the motive? Greed, a reward. See, he was about what he could get. And he was willing to go against God's people to do so. The next one is the doctrine of Balaam. And the doctrine of Balaam is something that's going to be heavy in the tribulation. Because in Revelation 2.14... It says, But I have a few things against thee, the Lord says, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. You see, the doctrine of Balaam was eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication. That's going to be big in the tribulation. Balaam taught Balak that if he could get Israel to get involved with these Moabite women, that they would end up sacrificing to idols and commit fornication. And that's exactly what happened. But then, God himself would destroy them. Balaam's like, I can't curse them. God won't let me curse them. But if you do this, then God himself will destroy them. But those same two things come back in the tribulation. Eating things, sacrificed unto idols, committing fornication. Look at Revelation 17, verse 2. It says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. You know, with the great whore, Mystery of Babylon. That's what Revelation 17 is about. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
Then verse 6 of verse Revelation 17, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So there you have it. Both that fornication and eating things sacrificed unto idols, that fornication associated with their religious worship service. Isn't that weird? And then Revelation 2.20 says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Once again, fornication. You got spiritual fornication going on because they're whoring after these false gods. But at the same time, you got physical fornication going on in the worship services because it's linked with physically eating things, sacrificed unto idols. And that was the doctrine of Balaam, which is going to be big in the tribulation. And it's going to be a step further where they are eating the saints. And I could show you that later. But Balak pictures the Antichrist. Balaam pictures the false prophet. Balak pictures the Antichrist. Balak is king of the enemies of God the Moabites, just as the Antichrist will be the king of the enemies of God. Balak is, the, is afraid of the children of Israel, intimidated by them, because they were many. He's concerned with numbers, which makes sense because he's in the book of Numbers. He's concerned with how many people that they have. Just like Pharaoh was. Pharaoh was, he saw all those all those children of Israel, and he's like, man, they're getting, there's a bunch of them. There's probably one or two million more of them than there are us, and they're just going to come kill us one day. So he's intimidated by them. He's got the fear of man. So Balak and Pharaoh, both concerned with numbers, how many people there were, how many people did this army have? The Antichrist will also be a, uh, concerned with numbers. In Revelation 19.19, 19, it says, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. The Antichrist is going to be so concerned with numbers and how many people that he's got that he gets everybody. He thinks there's he could get all these little feeble humans together to fight against God Almighty on a white horse. That is complete foolishness. Not only is it not only is it just it's like it's egotistical in a way because he thinks that he's strong enough to fight against God, but at the same time it's being fearful of people because he, he feels like he has to get everybody together to go against somebody. Whereas you know, with me and you and our God, me and me and God is the majority. I don't need a whole bunch of people. All I need is God, you see. And like I said, Balak, he's concerned with numbers. In Numbers 22, 3, it says, And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're both concerned with numbers. The Antichrist believes a 200 million man army will be strong enough. Balak is associated with the wicked prophet Balaam. The Antichrist has a false prophet. And in Numbers 22 5, Balak is going to send out messengers to recruit Balaam. Balak has a hatred for Israel. And his request is for Balaam to curse Israel in Numbers 22, 6. The devil and Antichrist also hate Israel. And in Revelation 12, 17, the dragon is said to make war with Israel. But uh, Balak sends out the messengers in Numbers 22, 6 through 7. Let's read there. It says, Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. For they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I, I, peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. 
For I wot not, I wot that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. That's what he's telling the messengers to tell Balaam. And it says, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came into Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So Balaam had a pride problem. And when they said, He whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed, you'll notice that Balaam does not correct them. He doesn't say, oh, no, only God has that power. You know, he lets them believe that. And if he had any sense, he would have said it. No, it's the Lord that does that. But one of the ways that we show our pride is by not correcting people who flatter you. That's something you need to work on. When somebody flatters you, say, that's not true, or say, it's the Lord doing it. It's the Lord that helped me do that. Don't just let people think that you're you're good. And see, a lot of times they flatter you, they're just trying to flatter you. They don't even believe it. But, but deep down, you don't correct them because you agree with them. You think that you are all that, but you're not. Balaam thought he was all that, but he's not. But they also came to Balaam with the rewards of divination. They came with money. Balaam knew he couldn't curse Israel, but he didn't want to lose sight of that money. He didn't want to lose sight of that rewards of divination. So he says, you know, lodge here with me this night. Come on in. Pull out the sofa. Stay a while. Take off your shoes. Stay a while. And in Numbers 22, 9 through 14, God speaks to Balaam and tells him that he can't curse Israel because they've been blessed by me. So Balaam got up and said, the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. I can't curse Israel. You know, I, the Lord refuses to let me go. Now, this shows that Balaam wanted to curse Israel. But Balaam knows the Lord's answer. But what does he do? He continues to entertain the thought anyway because he wants the money. Many times we already know something is wrong, but we entertain the thoughts of doing it anyway. Just like Balaam here. How come? Because we want the temporary pleasure that will come along with doing that sinful thing that we already know to be sinful. Now, Balak is going to send more honorable men after Balaam. In Numbers twenty-two fifteen, it says, And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And this is going to show you that both Balaam and Balak have respect of persons. That means they treat people differently. They, say, they think some people are better than other people. And you're not supposed to do that. But they, they, they have respect of persons towards rich men, just like the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to have respect of persons towards rich men. And you're going to notice in your Bible that a lot of times... The rich man is spoken of negatively, and the poor man is spoken of in a positive light. Now, today, in the age we're in, you can't look at somebody and, and judge his spirituality or salvation based on how much money he's got. But there's coming a day when you will be able to. Because in the tribulation, you have to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist to be rich. And if you don't do those two things, you'll be dirt poor. You ain't going to have no food. So the Antichrist and false prophet, they're going to have respective persons. And you see, that's why books like the book of James, uh, a book that's primarily directed to those tribulation days, the tribulation saints. It says in James chapter 1, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It talks good about the poor people and bad about the rich people. And it talks about this respect of persons. You see, Balak sent these big shots, the, the big dog princes to Balaam to try to impress him because he, you know, he's got respect of persons. So in his mind, well, Balaam's going to respect this request more if I bring the big shots out there. He's going to be wanting to please these guys, you know. <coughs> but in James 2, 1 through 6, I want to read you these verses. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. 
For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. You see, you got a, a rich man coming in with a gold ring and goodly apparel, nice clothes. But then you also got a, a poor man coming in in vile raiment. And you have respect unto him that weareth the gay clothing. That would be the rich man that comes in wearing the gay clothing. And you see how the word of God is not bound. How uh, that's what a lot of men wear today is clothes that look like clothes that a gay man wears. Like a, a literal gay man that likes other men. You know, I've seen where it's kind of a fad now for people to wear these, for men to wear skirts in America. That's not Scot Scottish. I mean, they're just going around wearing skirts. Uh, I just seen where uh, this Lutheran church is having a drag queen night. And it's a man dressed up like a woman, obviously, wearing the gay clothing. And that's going to be big in the tribulation, I think. A bunch of effeminate men wearing this the gay clothing. But you, they're having respect of, of persons to people because based on their clothes. It's just like you when you go to church. You see a man coming in in a nice suit. And you think, wow, what a man of God. He's got a, a suit and tie on. That is the most stupidest thing. Like the, the more I go in my Christian life, I see just how stupid it is. And it, when I hear... Uh, a pastor or something judge another preacher or somebody in the congregation based on if they have on a shirt and tie they base their spirituality on that that is the stupidest thing uh, one of the stupidest things i've ever heard that's complete tradition you, there's that's not in the bible at all and there's no proof that uh, if jesus was here today that he would wear a shirt and a tie a suit and a tie i mean what are these um the most, some of the most wickedest people in the world are seen every time you see them with a suit and a tie. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. You know, I like ties. I don't really like wearing them, but when I do wear them, you know, I don't have a problem with them. But it's like everything's based on this outward appearance. And what that is is, you know, having respect of persons a lot of times. Judging somebody on their clothes and what they have, and it's, you know, what what did the Pharisees do? They loved to walk in long robes. They, religious clothing. It's become religious clothing, in a sense. You know, I heard Jack Kyle say one time, and basically described how he judged a man's spirituality on if he wore a suit and a tie to church. Well, who do you think is heavily involved in buying children in the sex trafficking rings rich businessmen what do they wear suit and a tie so the the mo these wicked uh politicians what do they wear everywhere they go a suit and a tie it just it's got nothing to do with whether you're a christian how spiritual you are and i don't i don't believe that god cares what you wear as long as you're dressing modestly but you see all this this talk here in james 2 specifically about somebody respecting somebody that comes in in nice clothes and being mean to somebody that comes in with a poor man's clothes. When you go to church, you need to be as nice to the guy wearing a suit and a tie as you are the guy coming in that kind of stinks a little bit wearing a, a rock band t-shirt and jeans with holes in it. Maybe that guy just doesn't have anything else. Maybe he doesn't know that he shouldn't listen to rock music. You just got to let people, you know, you got to be patient with people, long-suffering with people. But it says in James 2, 3, And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, the nice clothes, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. You know, you sit over here in this bad place. I'm going to put this guy in the nice clothes in the VIP section. He says, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him, but ye have despised the poor? Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not rich men oppress you 
Isn't that something? It talks so negatively about the rich man in the Bible. Example, another example, Luke 16. The rich man is the one that goes to hell. Lazarus, the poor man, is the one that goes to Ab into Abraham's bosom. Numbers twenty two sixteen through 17 says, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. Just like the devil approached Jesus and offered him all the kingdoms of the world in exchange for worship, that is exactly Balak's idea. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Balaam is trying to sound so spiritual, but he's a thief in his heart. But notice, Balak's house is full of silver and gold. If you've read the book of Revelation, Revelation 9, 20, and 18, 12 showed you that the idols are silver and gold during the reign of the Antichrist. So there's a number, another similarity. And another type of Antichrist in the Bible named Nebuchadnezzar has a golden image that he wants people to worship in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, men today have idols of silver and gold. Look at the back of the iPhone. Take the case off. Most times, what is it? Silver or gold? You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Balaam wants them to tarry all night, and he leaves with them in the morning. While Balaam claims to not want to go against the Lord, he has those material items of this world on his heart. He has the riches of this world on his heart. But when Balaam leaves the next day, uh, Balaam's ass sees the angel of God standing and knocks Balaam off. You know the story. The ass is sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way. He starts freaking out. Balaam gets mad, hits the ass, and the Lord stands in the way of Balak and Balaam destroying Israel. Here's your, here's your picture. The angel of the Lord, which is the Lord himself, he stands, he's there standing in the way of Balak and Balaam, their plan to destroy Israel as he stands in the way of the Antichrist destroying Israel. You see, it's the Lord that gets involved both times. It says in Numbers twenty two twenty two, And God's anger was kindled because he went, because Balaam went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way, and went to the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. So you got the Lord there with the sword drawn in his hand, just like he's coming back at the second coming. And the angel of the Lord is the Lord. Don't make a mistake about it. And he'll be standing in the way of the Antichrist and his men who are trying to destroy Israel. And he's going to have a sword to smite them. Here the angel of the Lord stands in the way of Balaam, who's on his way to consult with those who want to destroy Israel, who have been blessed. And in Numbers twenty-two twenty-four, But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And then you got the Lord standing in front of you. So there won't be a way to escape. There was no way for Balaam to escape. There's going to be no way for, for anybody on this earth to escape the coming of the Lord. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. That reminds me of the stone cut without hands crushing the feet of the image, you know. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. <coughs> no escape. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? Isn't the Bible an amazing book? We are in the book of Numbers. 
This is a book a lot of people won't read because they think it's boring. But what is the plot of just about every kid's movie on the planet that they love? Talking animals. And that's what's going on here. You got a talking animal. Something else. Balaam is associated with a thing that doesn't normally speak. The ass. The false prophet in Revelation is associated with something that wouldn't normally speak. The false prophet actually causes the image of the beast to speak. In Revelation thirteen fifteen, it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Another plot of kids' movies is right there. Life given to an inanimate object. And that's what you see in Pinocchio. You know, life given to a boy that's not a real boy. You see that in Beauty and the Beast. You see it in The Little Toaster, all these cartoons. Life given to an inanimate object. You see talking animals. Because there's no new, no new thing under the sun. Hollywood can't get around the Bible. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. The crazy thing is, Balaam doesn't seem shocked or surprised or astonished or afraid that the ass is talking. Uh, Balaam, being a sorcerer, has probably seen all kinds of things like this happen before, maybe even caused it to happen himself with the help of the devil. But the moral of the story is, if God can use this jackass to knock some sense into Balaam, he can use a jackass like you too. I mean, you don't have to be some great one. I mean, you can be your jackass self and knock some sense into somebody using the word of the Lord. It says in Job eleven twelve, for vain men would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's cult. And that's exactly what you are. You're at best a glorified donkey when it comes to your flesh. Now, when you're your inner man, it's as holy as it can get. But the outside, you're nothing but a donkey. And notice that that, that that ass fell out from under Balaam. And if that represents the people, you can see in Revelation who's giving the Antichrist and the false prophet a lot of their power is the people gathering together behind him. You see, they're gathering together behind him. They're gathering with the devil. And the if, if they had that knocked out from under them, they're going to lose a lot of their power. You see, if, we, if the Bible believers could gather together on the Lord's side, imagine what we could get done. The Lord could use us to get done. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. You see, the Lord had to open the eyes of Balaam. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the second coming. It says in Revelation, Behold, every eye shall see him. The next thing, the Antichrist and false prophet will both one day fall down before Jesus Christ. Just like Balaam falls down flat on his face right here. Numbers 22, 32 through 34. Says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. So the Lord tells Balaam, he can go with the men, but only speak the words of the Lord. But that's not what he does. And then in verse 41 in Numbers 22, you have that satanic trinity where it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Notice that Balak will keep taking Balaam to different places to persuade him. Isn't that similar to how the devil did with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 during the temptation? 
you'll notice that he takes them up to the high places. Balak takes Balaam up to the high places. The devil takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. He takes him up to an exceeding high mountain in Matthew 4, 5 through 8. You see, the things that go on in the high places of Baal is wicked stuff. To name a few, fornication and eating things offered to idols. The Antichrist and false prophet will both be involved in these things. And moving on to chapter 23, we notice that they have no use for the lamb. In Numbers 23, 1 and 2, it says, And Balaam said to Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. They're using God's perfect number. They got a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. No lamb, because they have no use for the lamb. Just as the Antichrist and false prophet will have no use for the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Through this chapter, you'll see that Balaam comes to the conclusion that God won't let him curse Israel, no matter how once he, no matter how much he wants permission to do so. You'll also see that uh, Balak realizes that Balaam is not going to defy Israel. Something else notable is that the devil and his men have to have permission before they can touch God's people. Bala or Balaam wanted so badly to curse Israel, but it's like he couldn't get that permission to do so. Numbers 23, 20 through 23 says, Behold, I have received commandment to bless. This is Balaam talking. And he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, which is Israel. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the sh uh, shout of a king is among them. <coughs> God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? And then in Numbers 24, 10 through 11, And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called you, I called thee to curse me, mine enemies. And behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee into great honor. But lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. That's significant. Balak says the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. You see, any honor or promotion Balak could give Balaam would simply be the pleasures of sin for a season. I would count it an honor for God to keep me back from getting honor from the devil. That would, that's the best thing for me. Any time that God keeps me or gets involved in keeping me from doing something I shouldn't do, what more could you ask for? Because he may not curse Israel, but he tells Balak how to uh, get God, to, God himself to destroy Israel. That is the the error of Balaam. That's the or that's the doctrine of Balaam. Or no, that's the error of Balaam. And he's even though he's got the answer, he is he's doing it anyway. He's he's going against God anyway. He knows that God's gonna bless Israel, that wants to bless Israel. But what does he do? To shack up with Balak and those people? He, he consults with him. He tells him a way to get God to destroy them himself. He, he tells him that if he can cause them to fornicate and get into idolatry with the Moabites, that God will destroy them himself. And in Numbers 25, 1 through 2, it says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. This is the outcome of the teaching of Balaam. Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Balak's king of Moab. He's getting them to intermingle with his people. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. Fornication and sacrificing to idols there. This is exactly what will go on in the tribulation. And in Numbers thirty-one sixteen, this is where you have it where it's, it's said that this is 
the council of Balaam. It says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a great plague among the congregation of the Lord. For this reason here, Balaam is like a worldly preacher who claims that he speaks the word of the Lord, but really his mind is on his own wallet or pocketbook, if, if you're Joyce Meyer. Or even some of these men preachers may carry purses these days. But the council of Balaam was destructive. It says in Nahum 111, talking about the Antichrist, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. This referring to the Antichrist, he will also counsel men to go directly against God, just as Balaam did, just as Balak wanted to do. But these are some of the most wicked villains in the Bible. And the reason these villains are in here, you always got a villain. The reason they're in here is because God uses these wicked men to show you his wrath and his power and his judgment. He doesn't make them be wicked. He gives them the choice. But the moment they choose to go against him, he will use them as an example. He will use them to show his wrath and make his power known. But this has been another episode of Fighting the Famines, Bible Villains, Balak, Balaam, and Baal.